Hey there, and welcome to What's the Story? We're an inquisitive bunch of hosts on a mission to uncover stories about faith and courage from everyday people. In doing that, we get the privilege of chatting with amazing guests and have the opportunity to delve into their faith journey, the hurdles they've overcome, and the life lessons they've learned along the way. If you enjoy our podcast, don't forget to subscribe and sign up for our weekly newsletter at our website, whatsthestorypodcast.com. It's your direct line to the latest episodes and detailed show notes delivered straight to your inbox. What's the Story is brought to you by Crowd Church, who fully understand that stepping into a traditional church might not be everyone's cup of joe. Crowd Church provides a digital sanctuary, a safe space to explore the Christian faith where you can engage in meaningful conversations rather than just simply spectating. So whether you're new to the Christian faith or in search of a new church family, visit crowd.church. And if you have any questions, just drop them an email to hello at crowd.church. They would love to connect with you. And now, let's meet your host and our special guest for today. Well, I'm here with uh, Joanna Wilson, all the way from the Pacific Northwest. Now, it's fair to say, Joanna, that we have met before, only digitally, uh, in a very similar format, you were on uh, one of our other podcasts and you came on and you shared your story. And I was like, man, we need to get you on uh, on this one on what's the story, because I was so intrigued by your story. And we're going to get into that a little bit. You'll find out, listeners, why I'm why I'm certainly intrigued. But you're you're involved in business. Uh, you live in the Pacific Northwest. You do all kinds of cool things. You're a big fan on bringing faith into work. You've got some sort of volunteer work which is close to your heart and it seems uh you have a dog called kingsley which gets mentioned everywhere uh, which i remember from the previous podcast so uh joanna great to have you on the show thank you for doing this yeah thank you so much matt it's very good to be back so yeah it's good to catch up again very good to catch up and how is kingsley how's the dog he's doing well yeah living his best life and I think he's gone through a couple of tennis balls this week. So. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> yes, just, yes they, you just got them on repeat order on subscription from Amazon or something. I do. I have a big bag. I buy a big bag of them every six months or so. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. What kind of, I don't think I asked you this actually on the podcast before, but what kind of dog is Kingsley? What's the breed? Um, he's a, a boxer lab mix. Oh, wow. Yeah, so he has that kind of friendly lab, likes to chase goat fetch type mm-hmm. thing. Um, and then the boxers, they sort of have this thing similar to pit bulls where they like to burrow their face in you. Like they mm-hmm. just want to be close to you. So it's a good mix. It's a good mix. Well, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. <laughs> Uh, it's um, it, it is it is an unusual mix uh, of dog, uh, and I can picture him in my head actually. Uh, beautiful, beautiful yeah. color. What color it, do we have? What color is he? He, you can search online at the Boxador and it'll give you kind of the varying shades, but he's kind of a brindle, brown, black, stripy yeah. kind of dog. That's That was so. the image I had in my head, the sort of the brown black. Yeah. So, okay, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, so, <laughs> well, I'm good. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, we could talk about Kingsley all day, I suppose, but um, it's not a dog about, it's not a dog, it's not a podcast about dogs. Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, yeah, so I um, I grew up in Northern California um, and currently live in the Pacific Northwest um, near Portland, Oregon. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I was raised um, the child of two Protestant ministers. Uh, we were in the Assemblies of God denomination. And um, and then I kind of went on my own journey after that for quite a while. Um, yeah. And that led to a lot of things, um, a lot of life experiences, and um, eventually kind of landed me in Oregon, where a lot of my family is now, in the world of business and startup companies and um, I've always been, I think one of the gifts that God gave me as a child was just loving business. And I was mm. always starting little companies and I always knew I was always good at organizing people. Mm-hmm. Um, and so thankfully he, that kind of ripened into fruition in my mid thirties. And so, um, yeah, so continuing with that and I'm just passionate about helping people with their businesses and, mm. um, 
always trying to figure out like how can I bring God to work with yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm still, it's it's funny because I've been doing business for I, I don't know how long. I think I started business when Noah was around, but um, same question in my head, like, God, how do I bring you into business? It's interesting, actually, you're up in Portland. Um, last year, uh, or up near Portland, last year, I, I went up to that part of the world for the first time. Uh, and I went to Astoria, um, where they filmed The Goonies. Uh, and um, in really? fact, on the, yeah, yeah, it's great. We There's this really great story when we went to that house there. Because I was a child of the 80s, right? So I, I wanted to go see all the Goonies stuff and the house that was up there in, in, in Oregon. And I was like, I, I, I really wanted to go see it. And so I was, the friends I was staying with, we went up, we went up to the house. As, I was, as, I was, we, as we were walking up the driveway, the guy that just literally bought that house, because it had never been sold since a movie was made, um, and he'd bought it like a few months earlier off the lady, the original owner, he was coming out of the house and we just got talking to him. He invited us in. I spent two and a half hours just going around that house, just chatting with him. He came on the podcast that you're on, Push To Be More. Bayman Zachary is his name. Really fascinating story. Lovely guy. Just, you know, really, really, really fascinating. So I've, I have very good memories of that part of the world. Oh, very cool. Yes, yeah, so the Goonies house is a staple uh, tourist attraction here. Yeah. For, and People in Oregon are very proud of it. So. Yeah, 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 no, they are totally, and it was it, it was great to meet him, and yeah, just a big. And you he know, was a big fan of the movie, right? And that's why he bought it, or oh, totally, yeah, 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 okay. yeah, 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 totally. The reason why he bought it, and um, uh, he's just so passionate about sort of getting that house back to where it was in the movie because it looks a little bit different now, and all this. Anyway, I, I'll let you listen to his story. Just a really great guy. Uh, Bayman and um, just loved it, loved it, loved it. So lots of good memories uh, of being in that part of the world. Very beautiful, actually. Very, a lot like England. Weather. I mean, we were talking about this before we hit record, right? Uh, the weather. It's just like I was, as in, as in England. It was just very odd. Yes, I. Um, my husband is very, very into British football, and that was how I learned how rainy England was. And, <laughs> you know, I was like, it's just like Oregon. Yeah. Uh, so if we ever move there, it'll be a easy transition, I think. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt, no doubt. Just bring your your raincoat and your wellies, you'll be fine. What football yeah. team is he? Um, is he? Is he a big fan of? Do you know? Uh, Arsenal. Oh well, okay. This interview is now over. What's that? <laughs> this, we're just we're not going to talk anymore. Oh. Uh, <laughs> 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 it's funny because um, I'm, I live in Liverpool here in England and, I'm, and yeah. the, the reason yeah. I came to Liverpool was purely because of the football team. I, I came to school here, to the university here back in 92 and I chose the university just because I was a Liverpool fan. Not because the school was good, not because the course was good, but just because I was a Liverpool fan, right? Yeah. And so the church that I got stuck into here in Liverpool... Um, for the longest time, the pastor, there was two pastors in our church. One of them was an Everton fan, which is one of the rival teams here in the city. Um, uh, and then the, the the church was handed on. We had a new pastor and he was a Liverpool fan, which was great. Now, he is just in the process of handing it on to another guy who is an Arsenal fan. So I'm not oh, talking wow. to our new church pastor anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I had no idea how serious football was until I met my husband, and oh, yeah. now I understand it. Um, but he, one of his best friends, is from Liverpool and lives here and is a Liverpool fan. So they just don't talk when there's game when there's game. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, probably, probably a good idea. We don't talk to the, the, the teams. The yeah. other time. Uh, it's very funny. It is. It is. It is interesting how passionate it is. Um, so yeah, uh, great. You know, Paul, uh, you lived there with your husband and your dog and you've, you said you sort of grew up in this, um, Protestant house. Your parents were, uh, in the AOG, the Assemblies of God, uh, which is like a church denomination for those of you who might not know. Um, but obviously you've had your own journey. So if I sort of fast, if, if we sort of sit where we are and just look back over the past, however many you know years you've been living i'm not going to ask you which because that would be rude but uh <laughs> you know what i mean how many how many years you've been living what out of all the stuff that you've gone through and we're going to get into it a little bit what's your one message what's the sort of the thing that god's taught you throughout throughout this whole journey 
Um, I think that God is in control of everything. We are in control of nothing. <laughs> and, and that humility, if we can, if we can, as, as much as we can be in that place of humility towards God, uh, the better off we will be. Yeah. That's a really interesting thing. I, I, I it's, I was having this very interesting conversation with someone the other day in terms of control. And his big thing was he just lost control of his life. And I was like, okay, I'm quite, I'm quite curious to, to understand why you thought you were in control of it in the first place. Right. I'm just, uh, and to try and understand what you thought you were in control of. Um, and I think it's interesting how I was talking to my wife about this in terms of control that in, in my mind, and, and, t and tell me what you think, in my mind, the one thing that I have control over is how I choose to respond to something. Do you see what I mean? I've got a choice and I can make a decision at that point in life. And the Bible says, I've set before you death and life, blessing and curses, therefore choose life, right? These are the options, the choice is yours, Matt. And that's really about, <laughs> that's really about it. So how do you reconcile that then? Because you're in business, right? And so a lot of what you do is about making right, right decisions and so on and so forth. So how do you balance that you're in control of nothing, God's in control of everything, yet I still need to sort of work every day as, as if I can make a difference, I suppose? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I definitely do believe that God can you and does use work as a, as a means towards working out your salvation. Um, and you know, that's kind of up to him to figure out how that's going to happen. But um, obviously we need to be list trying, we need to be able to hear him. So mm -hmm. hear what he's trying to tell us to do. And so um, that's, that's kind of the part that I really, I think I struggle with the most that I'm really working on trying to get better at is um, sort of doing the things every day that, a lot that condition my soul in a way and my mind and my body in a way that will allow me to actually hear God because yeah. I've got all these like layers of gunk on me from not praying from if I don't go to if I'm not going to church um you know not not struggling to get better at the things I know I'm bad at as it pertains to what God wants mm. um when I'm not doing those things, and I, I think we all know when we're slacking off on something, it's like it allows a layer of gunk to kind of temporarily form where it's like yeah. you can't hear quite as well. And so um, it's, it's t I, I really look at it like working out. Like we're, we're going to, to fail at um, our attempt to reach God over and over and over again because we're human. Um, and, and I do that every day. It's like, I, sometimes I don't pray in the routine that I like to have, you know, mm -hmm. I like to try, try to pray at least twice a day for like 10 minutes, morning, mm -hmm. 10 minutes. At, um, and when I'm skipping those, or if I'm like focusing on what's going on in the world or like the news or, um, all things that are constantly trying to grab our attention, I feel <laughs> I feel less connected to God and I really can't hear him as well. Mm. Um, but I, I know that because I'm human, like that's going to happen. I'm going to keep falling down mm. and that's kind of just a perpetual thing that's going to happen till I die. Um, but I have to keep struggling to get back up and reinstate those routines and reinstate those things that I know really those actions that, yeah get me closer to being able to hear God and closer to God himself. Um, and so as, far as, as work goes or business, um, you know, I have to be doing those things first to really hear what he's telling me. Mm -hmm. um, but when I'm, when I'm at work, I really just do my best to try to remember to apply what I've learned from God Yeah. Um, every single day. You know, when you have that coworker that, or that person that um, you disagree with on something or somebody that might be difficult to work with. Like those are all tests from God for me 
to be working out my salvation and ref be refining my soul mm. to become more Christ-like. So the opportunities present themselves every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they certainly so. do. Yeah, they certainly do. Uh, I just, I'm loving listening to you. I'm kind of curious if I, if that's your one message that, you know, you are not in control, God's in control. What, how did you learn that? What happened, I suppose, for that to become the main thing that you've learned? Because it, it sounds like maybe that wasn't a straightforward or easy lesson to learn, or maybe, maybe, maybe it was, I don't know, but I'm kind of curious what's the story behind that. Yeah. Um, I guess I, I think that I really, um, I spent a lot of years after, after my parents, um, so I'll back up a little bit, but, um, my parents were pastors for most of my childhood and then they divorced when I was, um, fifth or sixth grade. So 10, 10 years old or so. Wow. Um, and when that happened, uh, my family obviously went through very heavy trauma from all of that happening. And, um, I think from that trauma, I, kind of like um, my coping mechanism was trying to be in control. Like I, I couldn't control what happened to my family. Yeah. And so I would do like little behaviors to try to control like my reality around me, just like little silly habits or, um, you know, feeling, I think feeling feelings of despair are a symptom of trying to be in control um, mm. or thinking you need to be feeling out of control. Um, and so I remember feeling that a lot. Um, and that kind of led me to uh, my teen years and into my twenties. And I sort of forgot about the church and I sort of forgot about God um, mm. over those years and, uh, you know, got, very interested in like other types of spiritualities and um i had spent a lot of time asking questions about christianity specifically and the sort of the philosophies that i was taught as a child um and i come from a family of philosophers so we pick apart everything from kind of a logical perspective mm -hmm. and so i i remember doing that and just feeling like nothing made any sense and like mm. the church that I was raised in didn't really have the answers to satisfy my questions. Mm. Um, and so I came to the conclusion that I just needed to move on from that and start exploring other types of spiritualities um, and of all different kinds and uh, moved into my 20s, um, essentially turning into a very like new age Wiccan type of thinking person. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I ended up, um, just very kind of enveloped in the world of the occult and, um, new age thinking and, um, with mainly Wicca, I think, AKA Satanism or Luciferianism. Although mm -hmm. a lot of people who practice Wicca don't realize that they are um, in kind of like the first level of Satanism mm -hmm. because they don't, maybe they haven't, they don't know about Satanism or they're not deep enough in it to know what the levels are. Um, yeah. it is a baby level of entering wow. that world. Um, mm. so, and the new age kind of serves as a, um, sort of a trap door that drops you into it. So it's like you're going down a slide of the new age type thinking and then yeah. you land heavier heavier things. Um, but uh, all of that, you know, kind of turned my life upside down. But I thought, I thought it was the way it was supposed to be. I thought it was good, even though it was bad. It's kind mm. of like the inverse, like what is up is down. Yeah. Thinking in my head, and um, some things happened during that time that um, kind of catapulted me out of there. Um, everything sort of eventually fell apart. Everything kind of crumbled. And I was forced to kind of start my life all over again. Um, the catalyst being the ending of a relationship that I right. was in. Um, and the ending of that relationship with this person who was also a heavy practicer of um, Wiccan and pagan traditions. Um, 
you know, we were very into this together. And so it not only was it the end of a relationship, but it felt like a breaking away from that lifestyle. Um, and it was all very shocking to me. Um, I, I lost my job because my job was kind of intertwined in all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I lost my income. I lost my person I thought was my soulmate. I lost um, my the place where I lived. I had to move away. Um, and my entire sense of identity was completely shattered wow. psychologically. So I, I felt like I didn't know who I was anymore. Like it was like everything had crumbled and I had to learn about what cognitive dissonance is, what Stockholm syndrome is, yeah. um, things that, you know, people go through if they've been groomed or brainwashed, um, and, and end up getting out of that, like kind of what happens to your brain because it, it kind of splits a little bit. Um, or rather it's, it's splitting when you're in those situation, but in situations, but when you come out of it, um, it's like, you don't know what reality is anymore. Mm -hmm. You don't know who you are, what reality is. And it feels very scary. Um, so I was in that place and I ended up, um, moving in, um, with my mom for a while to kind of, um, like get my bearings straight. And I remember, um, basically I went from a place of, you know, having, plenty of money, having a nice place to live, not really needing to worry about any of that stuff. Um, Although I was very tortured spiritually at the time um, to basically sleeping on the floor at my mother's house. Just, and I remember just like, not even like wanting a bed. I just like wanted to sleep on the floor. I didn't want any luxuries. I just needed things to be as simple as possible because I couldn't process any complications huh. um, and so i slept on a mat on a in a sleeping bag on my mom's floor for probably six months um and at around that same time i just kind of realized that um there was absolutely no way i was going to be able to figure out how to make things okay how mm. how i was gonna be able to figure out reality because it, it was so shattered i had no bearings yeah. um and it, it could have also been kind of like a mental crisis in a way um which i think are often a result of spiritual crises um and so i and i remember kind of like making a pact with god um and i ha- at that time i had received some signs like i god had been sending me signals like through really weird um avenues like uh, driving and like on the radio i would just like hear things i would hear songs or um a message or um i would see things that just clicked with me in a Mm. really um intense way and i really felt like they were coming from god and it felt like god was telling me um actually everything you believed was wrong i'm here and everything you believed was wrong wow. and and so i i could hear that wow. but i didn't really know what that meant yeah and so but i knew i knew god was real again like i had I, he had come back into my my scope of vision hmm. um probably due to the fact that i was in the depths of despair and i was like at my lowest um at a very low point where like you have no choice but to be humble like you, you can't have visions of grandeur and, um, you know, goals and plans and, um, I'm going to do this. And, you know, life is all about this and kind of creating your own narrative. You can't do that when you're in the place where I was. Mm. Um, it's just, it's such a desolate, flat landscape of nothing. Like, and you can't, you can't fill it. I don't know how to explain it. Um, so I remember feeling and like telling God, like, okay, God, you know what? I give up. Like, I am so exhausted. I don't know. I don't know what to do. I don't know what that was. I don't know what's coming next. Yeah. Um, but I know that first of all, I don't trust myself to plan it. So wow. I'm not going to plan it. <laughs> Second of all, um, I know that I, I can't, and it's, it's not, 
it's not up to me. And third, I'm too tired. I don't have mm. the strength. I don't have the strength or the energy to, to try to create anything. Yeah. So, um, what I'm going to do, God, is I'm going to stop. I'm going to take a step back. I'm just going to go get a job at a restaurant and be a waitress for a while. And I'm not, and I'm going to go to church and I'm not going to think about anything. I'm not going to try to figure anything out. Mm. I'm not going to try to plan my life. I'm not going to think about the future and worry about the future. Um, I am just going to go to work and serve people food. Uh, I'm going to go to church on Sundays and I have no expectations or plans for myself other than I'm going to church to get spiritual protection from this dark craziness that I just mm. left um, that still felt stuck to me. Yeah. And that's it. And I'm just going to wait for you. And I don't know what, I don't know what's going to happen after that. So wow. love ya. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I didn't <laughs> say love ya. Yeah. But <laughs> wow. um, I don't uh, think I really knew how to love God yet at that point. But, um, and so that's what I did. I, I just gave up control completely. And that was really hard for me because um, I've always been very like worried and frantic about money. Like I always, I've always felt like, cause my mother really struggled with finances when my parents divorced. Right. Mm -hmm. So my whole life I've always been like, Oh gosh, do I have enough money? Um, you know? And so where I came from, I had enough money. Now I'm in a place where I don't have a lot of money. I have no money actually. And I'm getting a job that really doesn't pay any money, very much money. It's like, barely enough to live um and so like being okay with that and accepting that and just like letting go of all the material things as well like no you don't need this you don't need that you need food and a roof over your head and you need to go to church and that is all you need um and so wow so starting there <laughs> um it was really really interesting and amazing because over the next nine months um that's all i did i just mm. i went to work i lived a really simple life i got rid of all of the complicated aspects that i had built up around myself previously mm. both materially um success wise money wise people wise just everything um and went to church on sundays i wasn't baptized yet um i was just going to church because i knew that going to church made me feel better um mm. and when i walked out of those doors i could feel a, a really stark contrast and i it's i think it's always been this way but between what it feels like inside of a church when you're in there and then you walk out the doors onto yeah. the street into the world and that shift in energy it's like yeah. you can feel that darkness that you're kind of walking into when you walk out of church um and I knew that I needed to have a cloak of spiritual protection cloaked mm. over me every Sunday so I could keep that on throughout the week as I was walking around. Um, and so that, that was all I really did for, for about nine months. And through that time, I kind of, I was able to, I think maybe it was quiet enough that I was able to learn more um, about God again and get reacquainted with, Christ and with mm. God um, from a bit of a different perspective than I had growing up. Not, not too much, but in what, it, what was for me a deeper baptism, it was like a deeper yeah. connection and the things that I was able to, to learn through my church um, about just the life of Christ and how much that relates to how we live today. Um, and I was able to get all of my questions answered that I didn't get answered as a, a teenager hmm. um, in a way that was amazing. Um, and interestingly enough, um, a lot of the things I went through when I was in the occult, um, my, my church and like the teachings of the church really kind of highlighted a lot of those things and addressed them um, in a way that I had never experienced before. Right. Um, and it was, it just like it connected all the puzzle pieces together and i was just like oh my gosh like right. i've spent all these years like right. searching and searching right. i've been reading you know the ancient secret teachings of all ages and studying all of these 
you know, different ancient cults and these, these ways of thinking that all claim to have some sort of secret spiritual knowledge of the inner yeah. workings of the universe that will enlighten yeah. you. Um, and all it, all I ever ended up doing was spinning in circles. It keeps you in like an endless spiral yeah. and the spiral is, um, a, a common symbol in the occult, which is funny because that's all it is. It's just yeah. a spiral. You don't yeah. get anywhere. Yeah. You're just stuck Go in the around, spiral. Around. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, that's, I, thank you for sharing it. Uh, it's fascinating listening to you talk. Cause that, I mean, that's not my experience in life. You know, I wasn't, um, uh, I wasn't involved in that. And so I'm, I'm, I've got lots of questions, Joanna, if I may. Uh, you, you starting off, I mean, you sort of, you bookend that, bookended the that what you just talked about in terms of you know learning about the fact that God was in control by saying, my questions weren't answered in the church when I was in my teenage years, but they were answered after I'd been through. What questions were sort of, what would they be? What were some of the things that you needed to get answered? Yeah, so I um, I wanted to know where who wrote all the books of the Bible and why. Mm. I wanted to know um, how the Bible was assembled in the first place and why, and how it was decided that each book would go into the Bible. Mm. Because I, I grew up very focused on the, the Protestant um, side of Christianity focuses very, very heavily on scripture. Scripture is yeah. like the center of the universe. Mm. And... Um, and I think that was why the Bible was my was my initial focus was like, well, what, where did this scripture come from? Because mm. I kind of grew up believing it that it just the pages just flew together and that God kind of like divinely just assembled everything and there were no mm. humans involved and it just appeared. Um, you know, even though mm. obviously like you know John wrote the Gospel of John and Paul Paul the book Paul is full of Paul's letters to the Corinthians mm. and Ephesians and all of those things. Um, but I didn't know any of that. I just, mm. I had a very, um, like, I didn't have a very robust understanding of this, of the scriptures from a historical perspective. I knew what they said and I knew what the Protestant church talked about. They meant, but I became very interested in the history and like what, how, who is responsible for this? Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. And, um, and that led me to researching things like the lost books of the Bible and the Council of Nicaea was yeah. like a topic I discovered in the library when I was 14. Um, and I was like, oh, there was a council of faithful people that got together that um, basically, you know, decided a lot mm -hmm. of things about Christianity that influenced how Christianity is today. Mm -hmm. um, so those were like the first two things. Um, and I remember asking just questions about those things to the people that I knew in my church and, or, you know, like my father, my mother, and they were my main teachers and they didn't know anything about any of that stuff either. And so, oh, wow. um, and they'd both been to Bible college. So oh. I, wow. yeah, I, yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's like not all Bible colleges really get deep into those things necessarily. Mm. Um, so I just kind of thought like, well, how come you don't know about these things, but other, other people do. And mm. it just really confused me, you know, not mm. having those answers. Um, and so, uh, when I entered the, the Greek Orthodox church, um, it was all there and it was like, just kind of mind blowing how, so the, the Greek Orthodox church and and many Orthodox churches um, essentially have started with the churches that Paul founded and some yeah. of the other apostles. So some of those churches that Paul founded are still exist today and are living churches, living Orthodox churches. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the Orthodox faith, um, having that connection to the apostles and mm -hmm. those first churches that were founded had a really strong um, like drive to preserve the original thinking and teachings of the original churches that were yeah. founded by the apostles right after Jesus died. Mm. Um, and 
they actually have done that and es essentially really haven't changed anything in their manner of worship in their um, the way that they pray in a lot of the different traditions that were alive and happening in the very very first christian churches in the the century after christ died mm. um, are actually like almost the same today 2000 years later in modern orthodox churches which haven't modernized because mm they have wanted to preserve that. And yeah. so they've also kind of been these sort of guardians of history where, um, you know, these councils that happened um, and all of the books, the original manuscripts of the books of the Bible were sort of guarded by them as well. And they, you know, took great care to ensure that the books that were chosen to go into the Bible and the kind of the final um, collection of books that are, mm. that are read, um, were completely in line with what Christ preached yeah. and what Christ taught his apostles and the traditions and the concepts that he relayed to them when he was here. And so, um, and they, you know, during, in those councils, you know, if like an example would be if one, if one person there didn't agree they wouldn't leave and they would sit there and they would all pray together um, until there was a unanimous consensus over a certain topic, over a certain interpretation or how, how the church should move forward with what it believes about itself yeah. and how it wants to um, exist. And same thing with the books of the Bible, um, same process. So, um, and then another example would be, um, you know, like, uh, some of the desert fathers, the, um, the post apostle, like some of the generations of apostles and monks and um, as, as desert ascetics, people that would go out to live in the desert and mm. pray for their whole life to try to try to become closer to God. Um, some of those people have some really interesting writings and thoughts on um, just sort of like how what christ wanted us to do mm. and um so and then the what what they call the church fathers which are people like saint john chrysostom or um gregory uh, gregory oh, i'm gonna butcher his name i don't want to say it incorrectly there's there's two or three kind of main people who um really helped like i said to guide the church forward from the year 100 yeah moving forward mm. and keeping it in line with um with what was taught by jesus mm. at that time because there were a lot of cultural influences at the time that that really shaped you know um I, the way jesus spoke mm. um like why he used certain phrases why he um and although they're they extend into eternity like they're you know they can cross every generation mm. but it, it helps to understand at the time like what the culture was um mm. and um and so just learning more about those things um really helped me to understand that actually no like some people do know the answers to my questions it just wasn't my church and that's okay yeah, yeah. you know so i was able to like get some of those more historical answers about um, where everything came from and how it ended up the way it is today. Yeah. Um, and also because of the, that church's dedication to the preservation of like the original my mindset and in Greek, the word is phronima. It's like, it's a mind, it's the mindset of the church. Um, and some, some people have a different phronima than others, a different sort of understanding yeah. of reality. Yeah. So it's like when you're having a conversation with them, you're not really having the same conversation. You don't really, because your minds are shaped in a different way. Um, and so kind of learning also about how, um, you know, so Augustine was a, a, a good example of um, sort of where the interpretation of the original message of Christ started to get a little bit skewed and, um, not necessarily by any fault of his own, but mainly because he didn't really speak very good Greek. Right. And so a lot of his sort of interpretations of the Greek Bible um, were not 
completely accurate. They didn't have mm. the same mindset that the original Christians had tried to preserve for that whole mm. time. And he was very heavily influenced by um, philological, philosophical thinkers like Socrates, like um, some of those people at that time that were uh, very intellectual thinkers. Mm. And they were kind of, sort of offering these philosophies of conceptions of reality that were based on logic, not mysticism or the heart, um, mm. just very like, logic based ways of thinking about things. And so Augustine ended up kind of doing a little bit of a pivot, taking Christianity on a, on a logical pivot more towards intellectualizing the spirituality. Um, and uh, that's kind of how Roman Catholicism was born, was through that sort of mm. intellectualized thinking. And this, it turned into a very, a system of very heavy legalism. It's like, yeah. you know, there are a lot of legalistic sort of um, ways of thinking kind of a little bit more black and white. Everything is an intellectual debate of right and of truth or not truth and right and wrong. And it's like an argument rather yeah. than like, let's pray and like try to hear God. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so that I think that, you know, kind of learning about how that um, manifestation of Christianity caused some a lot of issues for people who ended up breaking away from Roman Catholicism through, mm -hmm. you know, the Reformation and mm -hmm. Lutheranism and Calvinism creating Protestantism because they didn't really like what was going on sure. with certain things in the Roman Catholic Church. And so it's sort of like then another pivot happened. Yeah. Um, and I think in the process, some of the his some of the um importance of like of history sort of got lost like you know and so i think that's kind of why like my parents didn't really know how to answer my questions yeah. um, about things but when i went to the greek church they were like oh yeah it's this yeah, like, this yeah, is what happened. yeah. you know because they were the ones who were they were there and they yeah. like it's a part of their of their tradition you know yeah. Yeah. so that was really helpful for me because and i also i think for a lot of youth who may be questioning christianity and they're looking at it from a, a logical philosophical perspective like well if god is is omnipresent or omnipotent then why would he have me even be born if he knows i'm going to go to hell like yeah. questions like that you know those are hard questions to answer for yeah. pastors and for parents and yeah. um and those are the questions that kids ask and you know kids are now are out in the world going to school and just they're surrounded by a lot of very anti-christian ideas and things that challenge what these what they've been taught what the christian children have been taught um and i would venture to say that more often than not those kids are really going to struggle to have conversations with those people who are challenging their beliefs because mm -hmm. It's from, like I said, it really helps to understand the history because, yeah. you know, it's it's actually very different than what the perception is that I think sort of mainstream secularism has of Christianity today, which yeah. is more like, oh, well, Christians don't practice what they preach, so why should we listen to them? Or, you know, Christians are hypocrites or Christians are this or they're that or they're hateful bigots for one reason or another um because they're looking at it from um an outside perspective but they're looking at it from a very western perspective yeah. like you know and here in the west it's like we've all become very intellectualized and we use our logic to make sense of things like we've largely forgotten how to think with our hearts mm. which is what Christ was doing. Christ was trying to teach people um, to live in our live in their hearts, not in their heads. Mm. But we live in our we live in our heads out here <laughs> most of the time. So it's um, interesting. It'd be, it'd be really fascinating, actually, to sort of um, to actually look at the differences between Western Christianity and something like the Greek Orthodox, Greek Orthodox Church, because they're going to be stock and they're going to be plenty, aren't they? In terms of the things that we have created ourselves um, as tradition, and I, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, the the Greek Orthodox Church and the Assemblies of God are quite. I mean, they're different, right? <laughs> yeah. They are. Mm -hmm. They are on 
different in sort of in some respects i dare say there'll be crossover in some respects i dare say there'll be differences but i'm kind of i i'm fascinated by the whole thing i'm i'm very aware of uh time as well john i don't want to take too much of your time but if i can ask you um when you're in the the occult you talked about um things that obviously happened i think that you thought it was good, but it was upside down. And you use this phrase, tortured spiritually. You were tortured spiritually. You realize this when you came out. What sort of things, I guess, I'm, help, help me to understand, I suppose, to recognize when other people are going through something. Or maybe somebody listening to this show is in a similar environment. And it's that kind of, what are some of the telltale signs? What are some of the things that you now looking back go, I should have realized this, but at the time I thought it was, was right? So I think the most important one is the uh, emphasis on focusing on the self. Right. Anything that encourages you to focus on yourself, even, even self-esteem, this, this like idea, this mainstream idea of self-esteem, um, you know, can be very dangerous and is actually at the root of a lot of very, very dark, dark teachings that people, mm. a lot of people don't know about. Um, but it, they all sort of encourage you to focus on yourself um, to a point of self obsession. You're so obsessed with like improving yourself mm. that it turns it can turn into a self obsession, mm. um, and it you, it closes your eyes off to everything around you that you actually should be paying attention to. So I think that would be the first thing because it's like God. I don't think God wants us to focus on ourselves in any way other than you know, that we want to be closer to him, you mm. know? Um, but yeah, so a lot of different um, faiths and, and things that are associated with the occult encourage you to, to be selfish in a lot mm. of ways. And a lot of the, uh, you know, you'll see a lot of like, quote unquote, gods and different spirits and things that are in some different religions and also in a lot of occult, um, types of spirituality, these entities and these beings, um, you, when you hear their stories that are written and you hear like what they're all about and like how you're supposed to interact with them, it all ends up either you're having to do something for them or they're, they're trying to condition you to become like them. Right. And I now believe that all of those things are simply fallen angels that are real mm. manifestations of fallen angels or, you know, demonic forces. But they they shroud themselves in these cloaks of, of glamour of like they can make themselves look any way they want. They can appear any way they want to you and they can look like they're good, um, you know. But if, if you feel like there's chaos in your life, if you feel like there's turmoil in your life um, and, you, and if you don't know how to make it better, like you, you're probably connected to something mm. that is infusing, infusing that into your life or the practices that you're engaging in are actually you know kind of like creating that chaos and that turmoil and you need to change something about your what you're doing every day mm. you know to get closer yeah. to god yeah so because god is peace and not that nothing bad is ever going to happen but it's like the the idea is that when a bad thing happens you we still have peace yeah. because we are so close to God that we still have peace, even when the terrible things are happening. So, yeah. no, it's fascinating listening to you talk. I, because I, I mean, we often say this at, at crowd, you know, it doesn't say in the Bible, it doesn't, the Bible never talks about self help or self improvement. It doesn't talk about um, self esteem. It says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Um, uh, it's an it's an interesting thing, isn't it? And I, I've, in some respects, I've seen Christians take that too far the other way. But it, it, this fixation on self, I would, I don't know. Again, maybe because I've I've not been in it, I, I don't know if I'd have if if I'd have put it at the the doorways, like, you know, wide is the road to destruction, isn't it? It's like the, this sort of focus on self is taking you down this pathway, which is ultimately what you entered upon and and went quite far into. Um, but you're right, it's that I, I, I can't remember a society that was as narcissistic, you know, and, and is so determined and focused on self 
uh, at the moment. Even the word offence, you know, we use words like, oh, that offends me, um, or you're committing some kind of violence towards me with an opinion that you have. How dare you? You know, this it's all about self, 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 isn't it? And it's it's quite an interesting one. So, I mean, I, I suppose being through or having gone through what you've gone through and, and sort of ended up where you are, how do you look at current society? How do you look at what's going on? I mean, you mentioned before we hit the record button that you don't actually, you're not on social media. And I'm curious, is this all is sort of interlinked with that? Um, it, 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 for me, in the sense it is that um, social media is, um, because it's so dopamine heavy when you're using it, it's like you're, you're getting those hits of dopamine to your brain, like you're getting a literal drug when you're using it and it becomes so addicting. Um, it, it consumes so much of your time and that time, so, like suddenly no one has time anymore. It's like, the, it's like, oh my gosh, I, I don't have time to do anything, you yeah. know? I feel like that really started when social media got bigger, like Facebook and Instagram yeah. and all those things, because our time is being sucked away by devices and screens. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, now it's just a part of the general workplace. It's like we all have to use that to communicate if we if yeah. we want to communicate in the world. Um, but but that's why I, I don't have it is because the more I have it, the less time I'm going to have to become closer to God and to be doing what God wants me to do. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, but it, it's definitely, you know, and not to mention all the things that are on social media, which are very, it's, it's a spiral. It's a mm. spiral of focusing on how do I look? What do I have? What, and like pride, vanity, mm. what do other people have? Envy, like mm. all these things that really drag our souls down it, like we just stick our head into yeah. this little portal of like, here, suck my soul out every time you get on social media. <laughs> it's like, um, so I just think as much as we can avoid that, the better. Uh, obviously, it can be used for good too, but I think you have to be really disciplined and really yeah. strong because that dopamine drug is involved. Yeah, like we can't kid ourselves that we, you know, again are in control because. So, yeah, that's a that's really interesting point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's fascinating. I, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you, John, and I, I feel like um, I've got so many more questions to ask, but I'm aware of time. Um, if people want to connect with you, if they want to reach out, if they want to maybe ask you some questions, um, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, um, they can search my, uh, my first and last name on LinkedIn and send me a message on LinkedIn, and that's that's basically the only form of social media that I do have um so the business and I, I even have to be careful with that so yeah yeah no I'm, I'm I'm with you I'm with you Joanna listen thank you so much for coming on to what's the story it's been an absolute treat talking to you and just uh I, I just thank you for being so open and just telling us your story and and uh and bringing that to light and um, it can't have been easy, but it's it's good that you've come through it, you know, and uh, I've got lots of notes, so um, I, I, lots to think about. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matt. I really appreciate it. And just like that, we've reached the end of another fascinating conversation. Crowd Church is a digital church, a community, a space to explore the Christian faith and a place where you can contribute and grow. To find out more, check out www.crowd.church. And don't forget to subscribe to What's the Story on your favorite podcast app. We've got a whole lot of inspiring stories coming your way, and we really don't want you to miss any of them. What's the Story is the production of Crowd Church. Our fantastic team is made up of Anna Kettle, Matt Edmondson, Tanya Hutzelak, and myself, Sada Fainan. We work behind the scenes to bring these stories to life. Our theme song is the creative work of Josh Edmondson. If you're interested in the transcript or show notes, head over to our website, whatsthestorypodcast.com and sign up for our weekly newsletters to get all this goodness delivered straight to your inbox. So that's all from us this week. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll catch you in the next episode. Bye for now.